do you see what I'm saying? This is, look, there's a lot at stake here. I mean, if Christianity is a true religion, everyone should be in church. And if it isn't, it is the worst human iteration in history. It's the worst thing in the world. And here's the scam. I'm showing to you quite literally Dude, in my black mind is and white. Right now. So Isn't it blown away? That's a clip from a new video put out by Rabbi Tovia Singer. And I gotta say, I kind of like this guy. I like his dramatic statements and his confidence. Now, don't misunderstand, there's a whole lot wrong with what he teaches in his video that we're gonna look at today. But he expresses it in such a compelling way. And I wanted to at least give him some props before we dismantle his argument. Because this channel isn't about tearing down people, but ideas are fair game. Scripture says that even though we live in the world, we aren't to wage war in the arena of ideas the way the world does. We don't use insults or slander or ridicule or, or ad hominem attacks on people. Scripture tells us to defend our faith, but to do it with gentleness and respect. And we're also not to contend under our own power. The Bible calls us to use the Word of God and His divine power to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And that's what we're at least trying to do in this channel. So, the lofty argument in our sites today is the teaching offered by Rabbi Singer in his new video. Let's get into it. In his new video, which I'll link to below, Rabbi Singer mounts an argument he believes amounts to proof that Matthew corrupted the passage about the virgin birth in his gospel. And he places incredibly high stakes on it. There's a lot at stake, because if Matthew in chapter 1, verse 23 lied about this, then the whole New Testament loses its credibility and Christianity is, a, is the biggest fraud that was perpetrated on man. I have to warn you that despite the claim to blow our minds, in the end, as you're going to see, the rabbi's argument really fails to produce the promised payoff. So, we'll start by addressing the popular line of thinking that underlies the general case that the rabbi's building. Then we'll briefly consider the historical context for our conversation before we finally engage directly with the good rabbi. And we're going to hear his argument in his own words. Before we engage directly with the argument, and I'm, I'm actually going to chart it out because in his video it's a little disjointed. But before we get there, I want to first cut the legs out from under the entire line of thought behind it. One of the biggest and most common targets of anti-Christian rabbis is the doctrine of the virgin birth, which is at the foundation of the incarnation of Christ. So they launch an attack based on Isaiah 7.14, which is the verse we Christians believe contains the prophecy of the virgin birth. Here the prophet Isaiah wrote, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Anti-Christian rabbis argue that the Hebrew word Alma, which is translated in this verse as virgin, doesn't actually mean virgin. It just means a young woman of marriageable age. Let's let Rabbi Singer read this verse to us in Hebrew. The text in Isaiah 7.14 says, Hine al behold, the young woman, is pregnant, the led is bane, and she's going to give birth to his son. The argument at the crux of his video is that, properly understood, this verse should read, a young woman, not a virgin, is pregnant. By attacking the virgin birth, anti-Christian rabbis, like Singer, believe they're dealing some sort of, of mortal blow to Christian theology. But the truth is, and this is going to sound pretty radical at first, so hear me out, the incarnation of Christ does not require a virgin birth. Don't get me wrong, now I want to categorically state right at the beginning that the New Testament teaches a virgin birth, and I affirm that and believe it's 100% true. But walk through this with me for a minute. For the sake of argument, as a, as a sort of thought experiment, let's grant the conditions proposed by these anti-Christian rabbis. Let's suppose that their interpretation of Isaiah 7.14 is correct, and it simply means a, a young woman, not a virgin. And let's set aside for a moment the historical fact that Mary was a young, unmarried, God-fearing Jewish girl who grew up in a patriarchal honor-shame society where male family members were highly protective of the honor and sexual purity of their, of their sisters and daughters. 
And let's also set aside the numerous New Testament passages that become nonsensical if Mary wasn't a virgin. For example, Luke 1.34, where Mary asked the angel, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? So let's set that aside as part of our thought experiment. And lastly, for the sake of argument, let's even pretend that Mary wasn't a virgin and she had been sexually active prior to becoming pregnant with Jesus. Now again, we're just conceding these points for the, for the sake of playing out the argument to its logical conclusion. So, what does this leave us with? By granting these points, has the, has the critical Christian doctrine of the Incarnation been undermined? Actually, no, because theologically speaking, the Incarnation isn't predicated on Mary's sexual history. What's it based on? It's based on the fatherhood of the Holy Spirit. And it turns out that even under the false set of conditions promoted by anti-Christian rabbis, we still have a messianic prophecy fulfilled in Jesus. We have Isaiah 7.14, which teaches that a young woman shall bear a son and call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then, 700 years later, Matthew records a young woman bearing a son called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And more importantly, we also still have the fatherhood of the Holy Spirit. Matthew's Gospel records the angel telling Joseph, that which is conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. And in Luke's Gospel, the angel tells Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So regardless of Mary's sexual activity prior to getting pregnant, her son, Jesus, would still be the fulfillment of prophecy, and his father would still be the Holy Spirit, which means we would still have the Incarnation. Now, the fact that Mary really was a virgin just underscores the purity of Christ and how mind-blowing it is that Jesus, who though he was born in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Okay, so with that, let's set the table for the specific teaching in the rabbi's video. Before we hear from Rabbi Singer himself and start walking through his argument, we need to look at the context for his claims. So let's map this out and see how it holds up to scrutiny. Again, the text at the center of our discussion is Isaiah 7.14, and the phrase in question in the Hebrew says, Hine ha'alma hare, which means, lo or behold, the young woman of marriageable age, or the virgin, is pregnant. The entire argument in the rabbi's video turns on the Hebrew word alma in this verse. Now, why did the prophet Isaiah choose this word? Because elsewhere in his book, Isaiah uses the Hebrew word betulah to refer to virgins. And betulah literally means virgin in both biblical and modern Hebrew. On the other hand, the literal translation of alma is a young woman of marriageable age without any comment on her sexual state. So we can say that an alma could be a betulah, a young woman could be a virgin, and in ancient Jewish culture that was almost always the case. But the alma itself doesn't technically contain the concept of virginity. Okay, so Isaiah was written in Hebrew to the nation of Israel somewhere around 700 BC. Now, fast forward a few centuries and we find that the Jewish people have been scattered. This is called the Diaspora, where many Jewish minority populations are living in foreign countries. At this time, Greek was the lingua franca, the common language that people from different nations all knew and could communicate with. Just like today, pretty much anywhere you go in the world, everyone knows at least a little English, and we can communicate that way. In antiquity, during this period, the Greek language served that same purpose. So a few centuries before Christ, the Jews translated the Hebrew Bible, which we call the Old Testament, from Hebrew into Greek. The Greek translation is called the Septuagint, which tradition says was created by 72 Jewish scribes, six from each tribe. And again, it was translated into Greek so that the Jews who had been living in foreign countries for generations could read their own scripture. Now, in the Septuagint in Isaiah 7.14, the Hebrew word alma was translated using the Greek word parthenos, which means maiden or virgin. So, unlike the Hebrew word alma, the Greek word parthenos does contain the concept of virginity. 
And that's the word that the ancient Jewish translators used in this passage. Let's fast forward a few more centuries to the time of the New Testament. The Jews were still a scattered people, and the Jewish authors of the New Testament followed the lead of the Septuagint and wrote the New Testament in Greek. They not only wanted Jews everywhere to be able to read the gospel, they also wanted to make it readable for Gentiles as well. And the Jewish New Testament authors considered the Septuagint to be the Word of God. In fact, the New Testament quotes or interprets directly from the Greek Septuagint about 170 times. So, with that historical backdrop, let's jump into Rabbi Singer's argument in his video. To set up his argument, the good rabbi introduces us to a German theologian named Franz Delich. I'll tell you something really interesting. The, the Christian Bible was translated into the Hebrew language in the, in the 19th century. It's a very, very famous translation. And it was done by a guy named Franz Delich. Franz Delich was a, was a, a genius of a Hebraist. He was a Christian, a devout Christian. And he translated, he was one of the, in the Christian world, he was one of the greatest, if not the greatest Hebraist of the 19th century. Which makes you wonder, how many 19th century Christian Hebraists could there be? But I digress. So what the good rabbi is telling us is that just like the Greek New Testament has been translated into many different languages, including English, Delich translated into the Hebrew language. He embarks on translating the Christian Bible into the Hebrew language. Why he does it? Well, he would like Jews to believe in Jesus, so he translates the New Testament in Hebrew. Now, here's what's so interesting. I, the, what I'm about to say, I, I've talked I've never said on air before, okay? So you're going to get this, and this is going to pow, okay? Okay, so we've finally arrived at the idea that's going to blow our minds. You ready for this? The rabbi is going to first point us to Luke's gospel before then linking it to the scam that Matthew allegedly pulled. So here's a very interesting thing we can do. See, what Christians are arguing is that's the word Alma that means a virgin, but like a married virgin. This is such a scam you have no idea. So if you go to the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 27, in that Bible done by Franz Delish, that is the text where Mary is called a virgin, to a, a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay, That's Luke, chapter 1, verse 27. The word virgin, you would think he'd use the word Alma, because after all, it's the word Alma that means a virgin. Yeah, I don't but see the word was, Alma here. But what you do see is Betula. So the argument up to this point is that when this German guy Delich translated Luke 127 from Greek into Hebrew in the 1800s, he used the Hebrew word Betula, which literally means virgin, rather than Alma, which is the word Isaiah used that doesn't necessarily refer to virginity. Here's how the unnamed host in the rabbi's video sums it up so far. Go the word it. Betula is not in Isaiah. In this, in this particular Hebrew New Testament, he's quoting Isaiah, but he's changing the word from Alma, which means young woman. He's changing it to the word Betula, which means virgin, showing you that the verse is wrong and he had to fix it. So the host clarifies Singer's point, which is that the wording in Luke 127 was intentionally changed by Delich because as a Christian, he thought Isaiah got it wrong and he wanted to fix it. In other words, if Delich agreed that Alma meant virgin, he would have used that word in Luke 127. So let's close the loop and see how this proves the Gospel of Matthew is wrong. It, it gets even naughtier, a little naughtier. I'm going to edge over like, how can it get naughtier than this? So as it turns out, Luke is, doesn't quote the verse. He just says it, and that's the way Luke does. He just says it. Matthew actually says, like it says in the prophet, Matthew 123. So you'll notice in Delich's translation, which you have in front of you, in Matthew 123, so he's forced. If you go there, he used the word Alma, because he's stuck, because he's saying he's quoting Isaiah in Matthew 123. In other words, in Luke 127, where Isaiah's prophecy about the virgin birth is not directly cited, and, and therefore Delich has more literary freedom, he uses the obvious Hebrew word for virgin, Betulah. 
But in Matthew 123, when the apostle directly quotes from Isaiah, Delich was forced to use the same word that Isaiah used, Alma. And here is the smoking gun that the rabbi believes he's found in the work of Delich. He did a terrific job on the translation, but he knew himself when Luke is going to use the term virgin about Mary, he knew that the word to use is Betula, not the word Alma, thus uncovering the scam of Matthew. That's how mind-blowing this is. That's it? That's the big reveal regarding the book of Matthew? This is the scandalous revelation that the rabbi refers to as... This is like the scandalous scam of not of the century of the last thousand years, two thousand years. So the scam of the last two thousand years is that an obscure German theologian in the 1800s chose the Hebrew word Betulah rather than Alma when he was translating Luke 127 into Hebrew. I don't know, Rabbi, I feel like there's been some bigger scams than that. By way of response, let me first say that this seems like an odd place to base an attack on the Christian doctrine of the virgin birth. I mean, the Christian faith puts infinitely more weight on the words used by the Apostle Matthew in his gospel than it does on the, on the words used by a largely unknown 19th century German theologian. That said, there are a number of areas where we could lean in and argue the finer points of translation and language, and even history. The rabbi's case is wide open to that. But I think the best response is to, as we did earlier, just follow the rabbi's reasoning to its logical conclusion. And we can do that by simply looking at Luke 127 in context. That verse is found in the larger passage in Luke 1 that runs from verse 26 to 38. This is where the angel Gabriel tells Mary that she's going to give birth to the Messiah. In verse 27, which is the one the rabbi's claim hinges on, Luke describes Mary as a virgin betrothed to Joseph. Gabriel tells her that she's going to conceive a holy baby in her womb. And what's Mary's response? She asks, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And then Gabriel answers by explaining that her child will be fathered by the Holy Spirit. And by the way, I found it interesting that the rabbi's video never even mentioned the rest of these verses. Instead, based on verse 27 alone, he suggests that in order to conform to the word Isaiah used in his prophecy, Delich should have referred to Mary as an Alma, a young woman. And here again, if we wanted to, we could actually grant the rabbi's point without doing any damage to the meaning of this passage. Because then, in verse 27, we would have Luke describing Mary as a young woman of marriageable age who's betrothed to Joseph. And when Gabriel tells her she's going to get pregnant, she responds in verse 34 by asking, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? So either way, the passage teaches that Mary was a virgin. Now, suppose Rabbi Singer wanted to expand his argument to include the word virgin in verse 34 as well. Now, he never brought that verse up in his video, but I think that would be a logic response to my argument. And if we substitute Alma in verse 34, the entire passage becomes meaningless. Because then, when Gabriel tells Mary she's going to get pregnant, she would respond by asking, well, how will this be, since I'm a young woman of marriageable age? Which is exactly the sort of woman who gets pregnant, right? And she was just about to marry Joseph. So there would be no need to ask Gabriel, how will this be? But even if that were the case, in the very next verse, Gabriel tells Mary that the father of the child is going to be the Holy Spirit. So here again, we have the all-important incarnation of Christ assured in this passage, even if we grant all the rabbi's arguments and then some. The rabbi's teaching in this video is a bit of a, a tempest in a teapot. It reminds me of one of my favorite phrases from Shakespeare, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Because even if we grant all the points that the rabbi makes in his video, Christian theology comes out essentially undamaged. The argument just doesn't prove what the good rabbi thinks it proves. And when we look at Luke 1.27 in context, it becomes obvious why Delich chose the more direct Hebrew word for virgin. And it, and it wasn't to fix or change anything in Isaiah. He chose the word Beitulah because it most accurately communicates to his Jewish readers what Luke was teaching in that passage. And as the rabbi himself pointed out, over in Matthew, Delich used Alma, the same word Isaiah did, in order to connect those dots for his Jewish readers and demonstrate the fulfilling of Isaiah's prophecy in Jesus. 
And here's my final point. The argument in the rabbi's video is predicated on two individual verses as looked at out of their scriptural context. And this is why we Christians need to read everything in context. Don't just read a single verse. Read the full section where that verse is found. The books of Luke and Matthew as a whole are the inspired word of God. And when viewed in that context, arguments like the rabbis just fall apart. Thanks for watching. Shalom.